All right, guys, so for number eight, we have that for some reason in a large city, 160 people were surveyed, okay? Of those, 60 were children, or C, and the rest were adults, and the rest, adults. Each person in the survey was asked whether they preferred milk chocolate or dark chocolate. It was found that 48 of the children preferred milk chocolate, and all this information is shown in the following table. So you just want to take a moment to double check if indeed all the information is shown, as a, and as far as I can see, it all appears. And so the 48 children that prefer milk chocolate are right here, because children that prefer milk chocolate, boom, 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 you end up at 48, right? Uh, the total of 60 children, that is right here, total for children is going to be 60. So my diagram has what it's supposed to have, see? So nothing tricky there. For part A, part I, you need to find the value of P. And so for the value of P, all this really takes is for us to understand how this diagram or this table like even works in the first place. And so because this last uh, column is total, right, that means that if this last one is total, it means that this one plus this one gives 60. And that also means that this one plus this one gives Q. So let me take a moment and really write that down. So X plus Y is going to equal Q. And also we know that 48 plus P equals 60. And so from here it's very easy to see. Ah, so if you want to get P alone, you can just do, uh, so you have 48 plus P equals 60. If you want to get P alone, you do minus 48 to both sides, and so P has to equal 12. Yes, P has to equal 12 following that line of math. And now for finding the value of Q, it gets a little bit more interesting. And so right now, we'll look at Q. Where is Q? There's a couple of different ways to approach this, and what I suggest I think is the ideal. So. Think about it this way. So Q is a so you can get it from two sides. You can either get it from what I expressed in light green. Okay, so trying to find X and trying to find Y. Or you can look at how it's related to the 60 up top. And so in this column here, it's the column of your totals. And so the column of your totals has to include all children and all adults. And so you know that 60 people were children and that the rest, which is my value for Q, the rest were adults. But how many were surveyed? Ah, 160 people were surveyed. And so technically down here, like more intuitively, you can say that children plus adults has to equal the 160 people that were surveyed. And so from here, if you plug in, well, 60 were children, so 60 plus the adults is going to equal 160. And from, from here, it's very easy to see that the amount of adults has to equal 100 which is my value for Q right here. And so da, 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 what you end up with is that your value for Q has to be equal to 100. And so part A is really not that complicated, but you do need to understand how the table works, particularly the column for total. Okay, so remember the column for total means that 48 plus P equals 60 and that X plus Y equals Q. And also, if they give you the total amount of survey, you can consider that for your total column as well, okay? So all of that is really just understanding what the table is telling you. From part B onwards, it starts to get a little bit more juicy. And so for part B, we have that three people are chosen at random from those surveyed. And we need to find the probability that all three are adults. Now, here's something interesting. In IB math, it is very common, not always, but it is very common that what you did in part B needs to use something from part A, okay? And what you need in part C needs to use something from part B and so on and so forth, okay? Most of the time it's like this, not always, and so be on the lookout to see if you get a massive hint on how to move forward. And so notice for part A double I, what's the last thing you did? You found Q, and Q is the total amount of adults. And look at that, part B is asking for da, 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 the probability that all three in a row 
chosen are adults. So you definitely have to play with the value of Q of 100 here. I'm about to show you how. And so in probability, the other thing I need to quickly explain to you is that technically there's a couple keywords that come to mind. For example, and this is the thing, in probability, you really, 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 really need to understand that how you think about the problem defines your approach. And so if you find yourself thinking and force yourself to do this, see, force yourself to think in terms of and and in terms of or. If you find yourself saying and, then you're going to be multiplying. Multiplying. <laughs> Dude, I cannot spell right now. Well, this is a math channel, so multiplying. It's not an a spelling child. <laughs> so and is for multiplying and or is going to be for adding. So if you find yourself thinking in ands, you will be multiplying. If you find yourself thinking in ors, you're going to be adding your probabilities. And so if three people are chosen at random from those surveyed, think about it. Three people are chosen at random. And the probability that all three are adults means that if I really, really write it out, it's um, first one is adult and second one is adult and third one is adult. Third one is adult. See? And so suddenly, well, look at that. You're thinking in terms of and. And so this is a massive hint. So what's the probability of the first one being an adult? Well, how many adults are, are there? You found that there were 100 adults. And so picking the first adult is 100 divided by your total, 160. The and means you're going to be multiplying the probability with the probability of finding the second adult. Now, what's the probability of picking the second adult? Well, you already took one out, so it's going to be, instead of 100, it's going to be 99, so one less. And also, you're not dealing with 160 anymore, you're dealing with 159. And so, that is a probability of the second one being an adult. Here is another and, so you put another multiplication. And the third one being an adult follows the same idea, 98 divided by 158, okay? So all of this is the probability of picking three adults in a row. Be very careful of subtracting one on the top and on the bottom, right? Because you are taking away one adult from the whole batch and the massive batch also gets minus one, see? So thinking about it more visually, maybe it can help. You can go to your graphing calculator and put all of this into your graphing calculator. See? Now, because I'm dealing with fractions, what I like to do is pressing alpha y equals and then hitting the first one, which allows you to put a fraction. This is just a way to plug in more quickly. See? So you can go ahead and do that. You can plug in all the different values that you're trying to face. And lo and behold, you end up with 38 and 158. Bada bim, bada boom, your answer is that. And so your probability of choosing three random people and that all three of them are adults is 0 0.24137, right? And if you want to leave it as significant figures, you can count 1, 2, 3, round it up or down, you keep it the same. I mean, round it up or keep it the same, you keep it the same. So your probability is 0 0.241. And so that is for part B. And if we see the answer key over here, there is the 0 0.241 that I was saying, just so you believe me, okay? And there's the triple multiplication that I said earlier, all right? So keeping that in mind, da, 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 you can, you know, solve it like that, see? For part C, it has two parts to it, and part C definitely gets very juicy. So part C, part I, gives you that, given that this, ew, the word given is nasty, and I'm about to tell you why. So given that this, find the value of x, see? So let me explain that for a moment. Remember earlier how I said that and was for multiplying and or was for adding? Well, given is for a very specific, specific formula that goes like this, which actually comes from your formula booklet. It comes from your formula booklet because given, so like p of a given b, Here's another thing I need to mention. This little stick there is a big hint for given. Okay, so that little stick is a hint that you're dealing with given. And so A given B is going to be probability of A and B divided by probability of B. And how do I know this? I know this because in your formal booklet, it's where it's at. See? 
So guys, I know I say this a lot in my videos, but the day of the test, you're walking in with two hours of sleep, two years of experience of this thing called IB, a whole lot of motivation to do at least well enough, your graphing calculator for paper two, and da -da -da -da, your formula booklet. So get familiar with the formula booklet, know what's inside of it. It's not enough to have it. You need to know what the formulas mean, what they have, and etc. And so the day of the test, you the moment you read the word given, First, you get a little bit scared because given probability is nasty. Yes, I'll give you that. But also you calm down because you say, ah, this guy on YouTube told me to identify buzzwords. One of them was given. And the moment you read given, you're opening up your formula booklet and you're trying to find it. And bada bim, bada boom, eventually you run into this guy here. And so conditional probability, so given a condition, right, you have uh, conditional probability, see? And there's the same symbol I told you earlier, like that weird sort of stick or wall also shows up right there. See? And so whenever you see that little stick, you're talking about conditional or given probability. See? And so given probability is a very specific formula. This you read it as A given B. And so A given B means that you need to plug in, whoops, A given B means that you plug in A and B up top and the probability of B on the bottom see so it's a very specific approach and it can be a massive hint on how to you know do this see and so keeping the formula in mind let me first show you how to solve the formula and then let me show you how to solve it visually see given probability is hard and so sticking to the formula can definitely work see so sticking to, for to the formula i mean a and b is just like a reference point see so i I can let's rewrite the formula with letters that don't show up for me. See, and so I can rewrite the formula as x given y is going to equal the probability of x and y divided by the probability of y. Okay, why am I doing this distinction? Because in the formula for given probability, the key idea is that the second one, so like x given y, the y is going to be on the bottom. Okay, that's the main idea I'm trying to share with you. Whatever shows up second is going to be what goes on the bottom. Because up top, technically, you can mix like y and x and x and y. It's the same thing, right? But on the bottom, you have to be very careful, see? And so the second one that shows up, x given y, it means y is on the bottom. Up here, you have a given m, so m is going to be on the bottom. So if you follow that formula piece by piece, so a given m, back to the context of the problem, you end up up top with probability of a and m. And on the bottom, you end up with the probability of m. So if you take a second to plug all of this in, it's going to become a lot more friendly. And so a with m means that we're talking about an adult and milk chocolate. And so an adult and milk chocolate means that we're talking about this guy here. See? Now, guys, what's the probability of picking this guy here? Well, it's going to be x divided by the total, right? Divided by, like, everything. Right? And so the probability of A and M is going to be adult and milk chocolate. So it's going to be X divided by the grand total, which is 160. Well, on the bottom, you have the probability of just M. Now, what is just M? Just M is the probability of picking someone that likes milk chocolate. And so it's going to be this with this divided by the grand total. And so it's technically going to be 48 plus X. These are the people that drink... Um, milk chocolate divided by the grand total 160 see and so from here you can actually simplify very easily and so the thing is when you have a big big fraction like this for example you have a divided by b divided by c divided by d you can think about it in two ways okay one way you can think about it which i tend to see people prefer this is that technically you have a big division symbol in the middle so you can express this as a divided by b, divided by Z, c, divided by d. And because of fractions and division and stuff like that, this division symbol means you end up multiplying by the negative reciprocal. So you end up with a divided by b times d divided by c, right? Now, there's a way to skip straight ahead to this step here, which is something very visual, which is why I like to share it. When you have a big fraction like this, you can do a times d divided by b times c. So you end up with a times d divided by b times c, which is the same thing that is actually happening here. You have a times d divided by b times c. 
All right, so whatever. That's just a lot of blah, blah. It's, it's how you solve a big fraction, see? And so keeping that in mind, here you end up with x times 160, this times this, divided by uh, 160 times 48 plus x, see? So it would be this times this, right? So this 160 goes away with this 160. And lo and behold, they did tell us that a given m equals one third. And so all of this equals one third. And from here, you end up with x divided by 48 plus x is going to equal one third. And from here, it becomes a lot more friendly to solve. You can cross multiply because you have fractions on both sides. So it's going to be x times 3, so 3x equals 48 plus x. Now you want to get x alone, right? So you can do minus x minus x. So 2x equals 48, the same as saying that x equals 24. See? So that is one way to solve for part ci, you end up with x equals 24. It's just the more hardcore mathy way, using the formulas, sticking to the formula booklet. It'll work, see? Now I'm sure there's at least a couple of you that still don't understand what the heck given probability does in the first place. So let me take a moment to really explain what is going on, see? And so, think about it this way. Imagine you have two Venn diagrams, see? And here you have A, and here you have B. Right? And so I'm going to put, you know, the same Venn diagram on both, right? And up top, I'm going to be drawing the probability of picking A and B, right? And on the bottom, I'm going to draw the probability of picking A given B, right? Now, the probability of A and B, it's where they intersect, correct? And so where they intersect is right here. And the bit the big, big question you need to keep in mind, you guys, is that, yes, they intersect right here, but what is your total? And so your total from here is literally everything, see? And so basically you're trying to find the probability of picking red if the total that you're drawing from is all of green, okay? Well, the probability of A given B, okay, so while the probability of A given B means that you're only picking from B. And so you're only picking from B and you're seeing the probability that you get A and B. And so what's the main idea I'm trying to tell you here? Given probability makes your denominator smaller or also given probability restricts where you take from, right? And so if you used to be taking by the grand total, all 160 people surveyed, now with the given probability, you're taking from less people. You're surveying only the ones that drink milk chocolate or only the ones that, you know, whatever, are female or something. So another example I can give you is imagine your math class, right? And you're looking for the probability that, you know, someone in that class like smokes, okay? Like smokes a cigarette or anything. Yeah, who knows, weed, I don't care, yeah? And so the probability that someone smokes, Right? And so you're picking anyone in your class that smokes, female, male, whatever, probability that they smoke. See, And so you're taking from the whole class and seeing if you get someone that smokes. Now, imagine you input given probability and you start saying, okay, probability that they smoke given that they're male. And so suddenly you're not taking from the whole class. You're only taking by those that are males within that class. And so, of course, you're not going to be taking from the grand total anymore but instead you're taking from much less, maybe just the males. And so that's why given probability makes your denominator smaller because it restricts where you take from. You're taking from a smaller group within the group already. All right, so that is what given probability does. This is the visual aspect, and I think it's important to understand that because part C, part I, you can actually do it really quickly from a visual standpoint. Because technically, okay, so the total that I'm dealing with is now going to be much less. And so what is your total like sort of restricting to, right? In this case, it's restricting to A given M. So it's adults given milk chocolate. So you're only considering the people that drink milk chocolate and you're seeing the probability that you get an adult within the ones that only drink milk. I mean, that only prefer milk chocolate. And so do you care about dark chocolate? Not anymore. And so for given probability, suddenly what you're looking at is a table that looks like this. You don't care about this side anymore. Now, all you're really caring about is 
what is the probability that I get X given that I'm drawing from those that are milk chocolate? What is the probability of getting an adult given that I'm only looking at the group of milk chocolate? And so suddenly from here you can say, ah, so my new total is 48 plus X. And when I'm trying to see if I get those that are adults, just X, see? And this right here, the X divided by 48 plus X is the same thing that shows up when you look at that right here. And so those are two different approaches. One of them is very visual, and I like to explain it just so that we understand that given probability restricts your denominator, makes it smaller, yada, yada, yada. And also I like to show the formula because the formulas always work. And so keep in mind the procedure, as long as I identify buzzwords and the correct formula, in this case using the word given, we went straight to the conditional probability. That kind of stuff is what really makes you get these points faster and get them more easily. So that is for part CI. For part C double I, you have that a person has chosen a random from those surveyed. And so we're back to the grand total, right? It's not like a specific like group, it's just the grand total, see? And so we need to write down the probability that they are an adult who prefers milk chocolate. And so this is fairly easy. Now we're talking about the grand total and who, what is the amount of people that are adult and prefer milk chocolate? It is exactly for X. And so now all you need to do is go ahead and say, what is the probability of drawing X divided by your grand total 160? Now you got from earlier that X was 24. So the probability is 24 divided by 160. That's honestly good enough, but, is, but if you want to get more hardcore and write the decimal or whatever, you can say that the probability is 15%, uh, see? And if we go over here to the mark scheme, well, here's the x equals 24. Here's the 24 over 160, which they leave it as 3 over 20. It's going to be the same as, you know, 0 0.15, see? So if you want to leave this as a fraction, you can also leave it as a fraction. How do you simplify this? Well, they're both even, so you can initially divide both of them by 2. So divide by 2 up top, you end up with 12. Divide by 2 on the bottom, you end up with 80. They're still both even, so you can divide by 2 again. It ends up being 6 over 40. They're still both even, so you divide by 2 again, you end up with 3 over 20. All right? So yes, it took a couple steps to simplify, but at least you learned something new. If top and the bottom are even, you can divide both by 2 in order to simplify. All right, so here's another tip or trick that I just taught you for simplifying fractions. As long as they're both even, you can continuously divide both of them, both of them by two, okay? Maybe you could have noticed earlier that, oh, dude, I can divide this by eight and immediately reach this, but not everyone sees that, and I'm not about to teach that either. I'm gonna teach you the rule of thumb. If they're both even, divide by two continuously until you can't anymore, see? Anyways, that is for part C double I. Then part D is super easy, but the wording can complicate us a lot. And so for part D, take a moment and read it. It says, determine if the events A and M are da, 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 independent. And careful, you need to justify your answer. And I know I already wrote a ton of stuff on this paper already, but take a look here. It's worth three points. And so... To my analysis, these are fairly easy three points, okay? And so I see a lot that they ask for trying to find if something is independent or not. And the procedure I tend to see is like pretty much always this, the same procedure, see? There's more than one method, but I'm going to give you the method that I think is the friendliest, okay? And so the moment you read the word independent, if you follow my advice of studying with the formula booklet, you will recognize independent as a buzzword, okay? Now, before anything, if two things are independent, that means that they're not like related to each other, see? For example, the probability that it rains and then the probability that you go to the mall, see? So if they're independent, then they don't care at all to each other, but maybe they're dependent because, oh, if it rains, then the mall closes, or if it rains, like maybe taxis are more expensive or something, so you're less likely to go to the mall. Okay, it all depends on how you look at it, see? But at the, at the end of the day, independent events do not affect each other. And more importantly, you read the word independent and you say, ah, 
that is in my formula booklet somewhere. And so you go to the area of probability and eventually you're gonna find da, 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 independent events down here. And so trust the process, trust the formula. Basically what this is saying is that for independent events, if they're independent, this is true, okay? So probability of A and B has to equal the probability of A times the probability of B. If they're not independent, then this is not gonna be true, right? And so over here, you need to determine if events A and M are independent and to justify our answer. And so basically, this is like the logic that we're gonna be applying here. So let me make a little bit of space. Basically what I try and tell you is that if they are independent, then probability of following this, okay, probability of A and M has to equal the probability of A times the probability of M. So if they're independent, then this must be true. If not, they are not independent. Now, thankfully, from earlier, we already found some of these like things or whatever, see? So on the one hand, the probability of A and M is actually what we did over here. See, so for part C double I, what we found was nailing like someone that is an adult who prefers milk chocolate because here A and M is adult and milk chocolate for part C double I, that's exactly what we did. We found the probability of picking someone that is an adult and who prefers milk chocolate. And so immediately you can write down for A and M, three over 20. So three over 20 has to equal the probability of A times the probability of M. And from here, it's fairly straightforward. What is the probability of picking an, an adult? Well, way earlier, we talked about, for part B, for example, the probability of picking three that are, that are adults, see? Now, what's the probability of just picking one that is an adult? There it is. Probably of the first one being an adult has to be 100 divided by 60. And so this is, this is the probability of, sorry, 100 divided by 160. So this is the probability of picking a single adult times probability of M, right? So probability of M, we said was picking someone who prefers milk chocolate. Now, this is one thing we haven't done yet, but it's fairly easy to see. So basically, you're going to take these guys and you're going to divide it by the grand total, see? Now you know that X is 24 from before, and so those that drink milk chocolate are 48 plus 24, which gives you, with some quick maths, uh, 72, see? And so probability of picking M is going to be 72 divided by 160. And so what you end up with is three over 20 equaling whatever that is. And so that is going to be 100 times 72. Actually, let me do it in fractions just so that we can all be very calm in our procedure. So this is the first fraction times my second fraction. So 72 divided by 160. And that gives me 9 divided by 32. Now, 9 divided by 32 as a decimal, how much is it? It's 0 0.2. 28125. Now, why did I do that? Because from here, if you leave it all as, as fractions and I and I ask you, are these equal to each other? There's a couple ways to know, but no one likes fractions, right? And so because you have your calculator, what you can do is that you plug in this fraction into your calculators to make it more comparable. And so the one on the left we found earlier was 15%. If you don't trust me, let's do three divided by 20. And so three divided by 20 gives you 0 0.15 and the other one gives you 0 0.28125. And from here, I know this looks kind of crazy, like 0 0.15 equals 0 0.28125, but what were we doing all along? What we were doing all along is asking ourselves that if they're independent, then this must be true. And if not, they are not independent. And so from here, does 0 0.15 equals 0 0.28125? No, it does not. And so your proof basically is because of this, they are not independent. And so determining if A and M are independent or not, we justify our answer by saying this right here, and we establish it from this over there, see?
And so for part D, you basically say that they are not independent. If I show you the answer over here, the method is basically this one right there. See? And so they are not independent. Awesome possible. Last but not least, we are facing part E. Now part E is definitely a little bit more different. The buzzword of the procedure that you need to identify is a lot more tricky. See? So get ready for a bumpy ride. For part E, for some people, now, I mean for some people, <laughs> for some reason, it can be assumed that the survey results are representative of the population of the city, right? And so if you're, anal if you're analyzing the city, you can just take the sample of this table over here, right? Of this survey over here. And so they tell us that 10 people in the city are chosen at random. Okay, so 10 people chosen at random. And to find the probability that at least five of them prefer dark chocolate. Now this gets way harder, you guys. Okay, and it's because identifying the procedure here is a lot more complicated see and so on the one hand you can do like a sort of massive tree diagram that goes on for 10 people which is kind of crazy and this is probably how you're visualizing it right but point is notice how a tree diagram works it's either like it's one of two options and whenever you have one or two options what you what you're actually entering is what we call let me make a little bit of space. Actually, I'll make space over here. And so what this is, is what we call a binomial distribution. And so a binomial distribution, let me take a moment to explain what that is. But basically, think about it this way. So binomial, right? So binomial. What does the word bi remember, like remind you of? So binomial, bisexual, by this, by that. It's basically like two options. Okay, so in probability, whenever you have two options, like only two options, like basically like yes or no, you should be thinking in binomial. So the other classic example is maybe like heads or tails, right? The other example I've seen in IB is like, um, like for example, I remember there was an exam, there was a, an exam that had a question something like with like vaccines, right? And so it's like, if, the, if it was a false positive or a false negative, I mean, sorry, like if the vaccine worked or it didn't work. So that's, that's also like a sort of yes or no question. See, so if you're thinking of yes or no, if you're thinking in heads or tails, or if you're thinking in a, in a massive sort of like a tree diagram, right? Then you're probably thinking in terms of binomial distribution. See, so when you have only two options, you should be thinking in binomial distribution. Now, how did I realize I had two options here because of these 10 people the only thing you're worried about is if they prefer or not prefer right and so the moment you're thinking about prefer or not prefer it's very similar to like a yes or no see it's either prefer or not prefer it's either yes or it's either no it's either heads or it's tails and period and so the moment you do that you identify oh, okay so it's a binomial distribution it's a binomial problem and big big hint here a lot of these probability problems put binomial specifically like near the end. Like I've noticed that they do that. They like to put binomial in between because you literally get points just by recognizing that the variable is a binomial distribution. Literally, like the moment you realize it's a binomial distribution, write that down somewhere, bada bam bada boom, you literally get a whole point, see? And so noticing that it's a binomial distribution is very important. And this is why way earlier I told you guys probability what it boils down to is how you think about it and so having the right approach thinking in terms of at thinking in terms of or thinking in terms of given and how it restricts your like where you take from thinking in terms of only two options so that you realize it's a binomial all that kind of stuff really adds up for doing the right procedure the math is not that hard i mean look at this Look at some of the math that you end up doing. It's, it's not that crazy, right? It's really not that crazy, but understanding why you're doing what you're doing, that is the hard part for probability, see? So once we establish that it's binomial, we go to our graphing calculator and we look at the tools that we have. And so the tools, hello, why is this not working? There it is. So the tools that you have for binomial distribution in your calculator, 
Because it's a distribution, you're going to press second on bars, hit that distribution button, and scroll all the way down, and eventually reach your two main tools, binomial PDF and binomial CDF. Now, much like a normal CDF and normal CDF, normal PDF and normal CDF, this is the main idea. So binomial PDF is basically like probability of getting exactly that amount, while binomial CDF is probability of getting from zero to that amount. All right, so this is the main idea I need you to understand for PDF and CDF. PDF is nailing exactly that amount, and CDF is from zero to that amount, see? All right, and so for example, if here they said exactly five, right? If it said exactly five, you would use binomial PDF and put an X value of five. But since here they're asking for, for at least five, then it's a little bit different. And so let me make a small diagram here. So, as I said, the CDF gives you the probability from zero to that amount, see? So let me just show you more hardcore. If you go to binomial CDF, here if you put, well, I actually did it earlier, but technically it's 10 trials because it's 10 people, see? And also the probability of them preferring dark chocolate, well, you found earlier that the, I mean, you actually didn't find it earlier, we gotta do it now, but the probability of getting dark chocolate, right, of this whole population has to be P plus Y. Now, you know that P is 12 from earlier, you know that X is 24, you know that Q is 100, and so Y has to be, basically, you plug it in here, see? So Y has to be 24 plus Y equals 100, and so Y has to equal, using quick math, 76, right? And so the probability of dark chocolate is gonna be this plus this divided by your grand total. So it's gonna be 12 plus 76 divided by your grand total. So that's gonna be, well, let me just show you real quick, it's 12 plus 76 divided by your grand total, and so it gives you 0 0.55. And so basically, probability of dark chocolate, of picking someone that prefers dark chocolate, is 0 0.55, see? And so down here, because you've got to find the probability of at least five that prefer dark chocolate, you got to find that out. We just found it's 0 0.55. So my apologies, I forgot to do that earlier, but I show you now, see? So we go back to our main tool, we have CDF, so you plug in 10 for trials because it's 10 people. You plug in the probability 0 0.55 because we're talking about dark chocolate. And this is where we find our first sort of problem. Because binomial CDF in this calculator gives a probability from zero to that amount. You might have a fancier calculator that allows you to do from five upwards. See, but the main issue that we're facing right now, um, anyone that has a more maybe older calculator or whatever, is that you have these 10 people. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And so technically, you need to find the probability of at least five. So you need to find the probability of nailing this, 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 and this. But your calculator only leads, reads from left to right. And so what you can do actually is finding the probability of these guys in red and basically you do one minus the probability of, of getting the guys in red, and that's gonna give you the probability of getting everything else what's in green, see? And why does this work? This works because we're talking about this specific thing called, da da da. Technically, it's, it's like complementary events, see? And so complementary events, the symbols you can see here, you have an A with a little like apostrophe. See, and so basically this is saying that probability of A plus probability of not A has to equal one. And so like, basically, if you take all your scenarios, it has to equal up to one. And in binomial probability, you only have two scenarios. So it's either yes or it's either no. It's either prefer dark chocolate or not prefer dark chocolate. And so from here, if you do one minus, basically, the, this is the main idea, see? If you do one minus red, you're gonna find green because red is those that prefer four or less. And so one minus the ones that prefer four or less has to give you the ones that prefer five or more. 
So one minus four or less has to give you those that prefer five or more. And so from here, basically, you can plug in an X value of four. And so this is giving you red, see? And so from here, you can do one minus red. So one minus 0 0.2615. Uh, six two, and if you want to do significant figures, you would count one two three. Do you round it up or keep it the same? You round it up, so it's one minus zero point two six two, and this will give you green, right? And so one minus zero point two six two gives you zero point seventy eight, and so that is a probability that at least five of them prefer dark chocolate. And if you look at the mark scheme over here, there is a zero point seven three eight which is the same that I got from over there, see? And so this last sort of technica technicality of one minus red to give your green really has to do with the fact that your calculator, how it works. By no CDF gives a probability from zero to that amount. And so if it's asking for at least five, it's five or above, right? And your calculator leads from left to right. So you first gotta get the guys in red and then do one minus this whole thing in red, which gives you the part in green. See? So ladies and gentlemen, this last part for binomial probability, it's a little bit harder, but that's also why you're rewarded with four points. I noticed that they ask it a lot, so it's worth looking into it at least a little bit. See? Anyways, that enough that is enough blah blah by me. That is for number eight, and I hope it helped. Remember, probability boils down to how you think about it. Mindset and buzzwords are particularly important for this one. See, remember that binomial tends to enter and it comes kind of disguised. See, it's not as obvious as yes or no. It's not as obvious as heads or tails, but think about it in those terms. It's like one or the other, prefer, not prefer, fail, not fail, stuff like that. See, binomial by two options only. Now I'm done talking. Now it's the end of the video. I hope it helped. I'll see you around.